Praise the Lord. God's good, right? Come on, let's thank him for being here today and his presence being among us. Oh, I'm so glad you're in church and so glad you're worshiping the Lord. God is doing great things. You may be seated for just a few moments and uh, thank you again for coming. Uh, there are a lot of places you could be today, a lot of things you could be doing, but you're in the house of the Lord and I believe God will honor you and do something great in your life. I, I said to Heidi this morning, we were coming in and it was still dark. I'm like, it's a little hard to come to church <laughs> when it's dark and rainy on a Sunday morning. So thank you for being here. Thank you, those of you that are watching us online. We pray that you feel the presence of the Lord. Those of you that are watching our television broadcast, we know that when you open your heart up to the Lord, he will meet you wherever 
you may be today, and so we're thrilled. Hey, if you're a guest with us, maybe you're new today or you're new, uh, new-ish to us, I guess, uh, and you haven't stopped by one of the Welcome Centers to pick up uh, a free gift, we'd love for you to do that today. You can go to either the East or West Welcome Center, and uh, they have gifts there for you. Within that packet, uh, uh, there is also some information about the church. We pray that it helps you know a little more about who we are at CLA, and so we're thrilled that you're worshiping with us today. If you're here or watching online either way or or on our television ministry, we'd love for you to uh, use the number on the screen and text the word hello. Uh, It helps us serve you better when we know uh, who you are and that you're here worshiping with us. You can also use that same number for prayer requests. And so if you have any prayer requests today, please send them uh, to us. If you're on our online campus, we have prayer teams that are there uh, to pray with you and to help you. Uh, this morning, they are there and they are live uh, to, to serve you uh, with whatever needs you may have. But we'd love to pray over your needs as a church as well. We're going to pray in a few moments, but uh, you can use that number to send prayer requests. 717 482 5994. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, CLA has been all over the world in the last two weeks. We've had uh, teams in India, we've had teams in Jolo, West Virginia. We've had teams in uh, Philly, (laughs) and uh, our team from India uh, left uh, uh, yesterday, or maybe it was uh, today's Sunday, Friday or Saturday morning, I forget which one. Some of them, they are in Nepal, Pastor Christian. So we've got teams in Nepal, teams in, had teams in India, Jolo, and Philly this week. Praise the Lord, right? We've been all over the place. The point of that is I'm so thankful for a church that says yes to the call of God. And says, yes, Lord, we'll go wherever you want us to go. You call us, you, you, uh, you equip us, and we'll go and uh, do the things that God has called us to do. So continue to pray. Uh, our team from India, Nepal, they arrive back uh, tomorrow. So pray, pray over them. Just a couple of upcoming trips. want you to be aware of these uh, in, uh, in the new year. We have a team going to Jamaica in February. And so uh, here's the important, uh, crucial detail of that trip. The deadline is coming soon. Uh, need those details in by November the 15th. And so we encourage you uh, to call the church, call Pastor Christian or Shannon, talk about uh, those things, or you can go uh, to clacamphill.com for all the details. But February, the Jamaica team, we have a team going to El Salvador in March. And then in May, we'll be going to Arizona to minister at the Navajo Nation. And so any of those trips that you may feel the Lord tugging you uh, about and you need more information, again, go to the website, call the church. But Jamaica, February 15th deadline, that's important. Also, Toy Share is coming up. And uh, how many, can you believe it's almost November? Your tree up yet? (laughs) Mine either. Sore subject. Let's move on. So... (laughs) Anyway, we're getting close. Uh, I believe we're getting close. So uh, um, Toy Share is open. Registration is open for families and volunteers now. So you can go uh, and and register for that as well. And you can do two things. We need your help. We need you to donate financially. You can earmark that. Toy Share, you can do that electronically through the mail, drop it off at the Welcome Centers, whatever method works best for you. Uh, Donate uh, financially, or you can help us with a bag of food. And on your way out, out today, there'll be volunteers in the lobby and at the uh, at the exits, uh, giving you an empty bag. There's inst- there are instructions inside the bag with the very specific items uh, that we need you to fill it with, and then in that letter, you also know when you can return it to the church. But it's about a forty dollar investment if you uh, get all of the items on the list, and then uh, the nights of toy share, the the those moments we'll be able to give food away, a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus, right? We want to meet needs uh, in every way possible. And so this is a huge help. Thank you for being a part of that. Thank you for giving and making Toy Share happen. Thank you for, uh, for giving food as well. You can go uh, visit the Toy Share booth today in the, in the lobby. If you have any questions, they will be there. They'd love to help you out. And so we still have some Greg and Sandy Mundus books uh, at the Welcome Centers. Take those. Give them away. Uh, we certainly don't want to store them here. There's not a lot left, but they'll be inspiring. It will, uh, it'll make an impact on your life and someone else's life. So they're free. I encourage you to take one or two, give them away to somebody. It'll be 
important. So, hey, let's pray. Let's pray over our needs. Would you stand with me? I know you have needs in your life. I have needs in my life. Uh, let's, let's take them before the Lord today. And uh, before we go into worship, and let's just settle our hearts and just invite the spirit of the Lord here. Lord Jesus, we love you. You're so good to us, Jesus. You're so good to us that you left heaven and came to earth. And that you're here in this room. I feel your spirit here today. Lord, I know you're here. And so God, do great things among us as we open our heart to you. And Lord Jesus, we just set, a time this, set aside this time to invite you. We give you space and room in our heart to do whatever it is you desire to do, Lord Jesus. We love you. God, we think of needs today in the room. I know there are many and some that are watching. We just ask for the healing hand of God, whatever, whatever it is that people need today, if marriages need to be restored, if bodies need to be healed, finances need, need to be uh, provided for, they need to be, God, maybe there's some, some t- transformations in people's, in people's finances. God, whatever it may be, I just pray, Lord Jesus, that you do what only you can do. And so we make room for you and we welcome and invite you here today. Holy Spirit, come and fill this place. We pray in Jesus' name.
Jesus, we love you. We just declare the greatness of the Lord today. We declare it over our lives. We declare it over our families. We declare it over our church. God, we put you at the center of our lives. We put you at the right and proper place, God, and we lift your name today high. We deserve the highest praise. We give it to you today, God, from the depths of our soul. We say, great are you, Lord. Holy is the Lord. We worship you today. We worship you. Thank you for being present. Thank you for being in this place. Thank you for coming and to tabernacle among us today. We feel you, Lord. We praise you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, and everybody said amen. Come on, let's thank the Lord today for his goodness. And praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shannon and the team. I just want to publicly say, Shannon, you have a powerful anointing on your life today. It was, it was incredible. The whole team, it was incredible in both services. Just really felt the presence of the Lord. Thank you for, for helping us shake off all of the, the heaviness of life, right? And just pressing in uh, to worshiping and, and seeing Jesus today. And so what a, what a great... Uh, what a great presence of, of the Lord that's here today. Hey, just a couple of things. Uh, our online bulletin, if you want to know anything about the church, that's the place to find it. We're a busy place. Lots of stuff going on right now. And so I would encourage you to go to clacamphill.com to find out all of the, the details. I don't want you to miss anything. I want you to be a part of what God is doing. I want you to, to be in the places where you need to serve and the things that you need to put your hands on. And we want you to be a part of that. So clacamphill.com. Uh, Christmas Wonderland tickets are on sale. They're going fast. I know I say this every year about this time, but we sold 80% of our tickets in five days. They're just gone. And so, yeah, praise the Lord. All for the glory of God so the gospel can be heard. And uh, so I encourage you, uh, if you are looking to invite someone, because that's the whole reason we do this, so that you can invite someone that can hear the gospel of Jesus. I will give a clear presentation at every performance of the gospel and an opportunity for people to come to know Jesus. And so I'm encouraging you to invite someone and let them, let them come into a space and an atmosphere where they can hear the gospel and have an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ. And so we'd love for you to... To, uh, to do that, uh, claproductions.com. We have a lot of email addresses around here. claproductions.com. Uh, you can get tickets or you can call the church if you need any, any more information. I want to thank you for your giving. Uh, it's because of your giving that makes it possible for us to be in Jolo and to be in India and to be in Nepal and to be in Philadelphia. It's because of your faithfulness to the Lord. And so thank you for being a church that sees the world and sees the need and uh, wants to reach the world for Jesus. And God has blessed us all so much. Aren't you just thankful for the blessing of God in your life? Do you ever, do you ever pause? You're right. And just thank God for his blessing. And because of that, we're able to give back. And we're able to release what God has placed in our hands so that he can multiply it and increase it so the name of Jesus can go around the world. And so let's pray. Let's thank God. Let's do two things today. Let's thank God for his, his blessing in our life. And let's ask him to increase our giving, increase what we release today so the gospel can be heard, so that everyone can have an opportunity to know Jesus. Lord, we thank you. You have blessed us so much. I know I, I speak collectively on behalf of everyone here and everyone watching. We're blessed. You've blessed us. Thank you for your provision and your favor. And God, now as we release that back to you, we pray that you would multiply it and increase it so that your name can go around the world so all can hear the good news of Jesus. Bless it, increase it, expand it, we pray today. We love you in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. Hi, my name is Matthew Fine, and I love serving here at CLI, doing cook ministry and drama ministry, and it's my passion to use my gifts and talents that God gave me, and I'm happy to be a part of CLA, that they give me so much opportunity to do what God designed me and called me to do. Yeah. <laughs>
You're a rock star, Matthew Fine. <laughs> we love you, buddy. Our lives intersected, Matthew, probably 15, 16 years ago, and you've been a blessing to my life. And it's been a joy to be your friend and to be your pastor. And so thank you for serving our church so well. God's good. <clears throat> Well, I pray you feel the presence of the Lord today, and I encourage you over the remaining moments of the service to just open your heart to the possibility of God doing something life-changing in you. I told the first service, I said, today could be the greatest day of your life. And at the end of the service, I gave people an opportunity to know Jesus, and people in the service and outside of the service that were watching came to know Christ, and I said, that's right, this was the greatest day of their life. And so today can be the greatest day of your life. Don't miss it. Open your heart. I'm praying for you today. We've already covered the service and you in prayer, but now you have to open your heart for God to do something powerful. And I'm not talking about religion. Listen, the world has enough religion, right? I was, Heidi and I just flew in from India yesterday. And I was in Delhi and I was in Jaipur. We were in Delhi with 35 million of our closest friends. <laughs> and so, and I saw people trying to earn their way to the God that they serve, crawling on their hands and knees, rolling to the temple, whatever method that they felt earned them a way or favor or a little closer with God. Listen, the world has enough religion. We need an encounter with Jesus Christ. We need an encounter with the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. And so I encourage you to open your heart up and let God do something. Listen, the church, I said this in prayer this morning to, to the pastoral team. Church has to be more than just marking time. Church has to be more than just singing a few songs and hearing a sermon. Like it's God. The world is too upside down for that. We need to come and meet God. We need to come and connect with him. We need to come and, and feel his presence and feel hope and peace. And so I pray you open your heart. Prepare yourself. Listen, I believe that God desires today to do exceedingly and abundantly more in your heart and life than you can even ask or think. And so are you ready? Are you available for God to do that? I'm praying. I pray for someone that's watching today. I prayed for, for someone that was watching. In between services, I felt really compelled to just cover our, our online campus and our TV ministry, just to cover it with prayer. There are people that are in hotel rooms that are driving. We hear these stories all the time. They're driving through town. They're at a bar. They're at a restaurant. They're somewhere, and they just hear something that God grabs their heart and does something life-changing. And so I'm praying today that somebody would open their heart. Would you pray that with me right now? <laughs> someone's life. I just feel like someone's about to give up. I just feel like the Lord's given me a picture of my heart. Someone, you're sitting at a dining room table or a kitchen table, and you're about, you're about ready to give up. And I don't know if it's on life or faith, but Jesus loves you. And there's hope for you. And it's not in religion, and it's not in a church. The hope is in Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody's life, I feel, is just right there in the balance. Lord Jesus, we pray for whoever that person may be that's watching. They may be driving in a car, sitting at a dining room or a breakfast table. They may be in a restaurant. I don't know where they may be, but God, I pray that you step into their reality. You step into their heart. Let mercy step into their life today, I pray. And we come against the powers of hell. Come on, church, let's pray. We come against the powers of the evil one that would deceive and lie and tell that person that there's no hope, that they should give up, that, that this isn't real, that you really don't love them. We pray against that in the name of Jesus. And I pray that the only voice that would be clear in your heart and ear would be the voice of the Spirit calling you to Jesus, pulling you to Jesus, illuminating Jesus, showing you Jesus in your life. I pray that right now, and wherever you may be, Spirit of the Lord, take what is God's, make it known unto them, I pray. I pray in Jesus' name. We cover them in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hey, I'm starting a new sermon series today. So if this is your first Sunday, you came at the right time, right? <laughs> starting a new sermon series. I entitled it simply, Be Alert. And we're going to journey together over the next four or five weeks. We'll get there when we get there. How about that, right? I used to ask my dad, are we there yet? And he would say to me, we'll get there when we get there, son. So, so I don't know how long it'll take us. We'll get there when we get there. But we're going to journey through the book of Jude over the next several weeks. The book or the letter of Jude is only one chapter long. 
And it only consists of 25 verses. And so if you want to say that you read an entire book of the Bible today, you can, we're going to read it before you leave today so you can walk away saying, I read a whole book of the Bible today in church. Although it's not the shortest book in the New Testament, Jude is actually the, the fourth shortest. Philemon, 2 John, and 3 John are shorter, and then the book of Jude. It might only have 25 verses, but it's powerful and it's timely. And I believe that God wants to speak to us collectively over the next few weeks. Again, if we open our hearts and open our minds to the possibility of God doing something powerful. If you don't know where the book of Jude is, it's the next to the last book of the New Testament. It's right before the book of Revelation. And honestly, it's a bit startling when you read it. It's in Jude's time, Christianity was under severe political attack from Rome. Sound awfully familiar, doesn't it? The, the church was under severe political attack from Rome, and there was a spiritual attack from doctrinal error and really just bad teaching, false teachers and bad theology. And so Jude calls the church to fight for truth. And I preached a series of messages, if you were here over the summer, and I entitled that series, The Truth About the Truth. And as I was preparing those messages and studying, I would frequently read through the 25 verses of the book of Jude. See, Jude fo focuses on, on the danger of bad teaching. He focuses on the, the danger of false teachers and, and bad doctrine and error and even rebellion. And again, Jude sounds awfully familiar and similar to the condition of the world today and sadly even the condition of the American church. His purpose is to challenge believers, to challenge us, the church. This letter is to us. It's to the church of Jesus Christ and he challenges us to live on point, to be on guard and to be alert. And I don't know of a time when when the church of Jesus Christ and followers of Jesus need to be more alert than today. Can somebody say amen, right? It's the world we live in. It's upside down and chaotic. Heidi and I were praying yesterday for the, the tragedy that's happened in Maine. And I said, I, don't, I can't even keep track of what to pray for anymore. There are so many things. It's, it's the front page every day. It's, and, and, and those are just the ones we hear of. Those are just the ones we know about. We live in a chaotic and upside down world. Church, we have to be on guard and be alert. And the book of Jude is a clarion call for us to be and live on point. This isn't anything new. The church is struggling in Jude's day with bad teaching, bad doctrine. It's, it, it's, it's out there today. Make no mistake about it. And it's not new. We've struggled with it since the early church. But I believe there's something happening today that it feels overwhelming. Self-proclaimed prophets are all over the place. With absolutely, hear me today, with absolutely no accountability at all. And they say things people want to hear and their popularity skyrockets. Does that sound familiar to you? What their itching ears want to hear? They are saying things that people want to hear. And, and as a result, their, their, their popularity almost overnight skyrockets. These false teachers and these self-proclaimed prophets, they appeal to a natural desire in our heart for justice and fairness in the world. But here's their error. They twist and distort current events. They make bizarre political claims while trying to make these outlandish and erroneous biblical connections. And when they're wrong, nothing happens. When, when they're wrong, nothing happens. There are no consequences. What happens? They just start over the next day. Why? Because they have no covering. And they have no accountability and there's no consequence for their error. Now some, I believe there are some good voices out there. I, I'm not saying that at all. And many of you listen to them, and many of you send me uh, uh, things that they're saying and teaching. So, the, so the, there, are some good, there are some good teachers there, for sure. Some have good intentions, and they're just an error, and they don't know it. Someone's not shared with them that they're an error. And then there are some that are just false teachers and heretics. And they make claims for their own personal and financial gain. And so here's the point today. Here's what I'm, here's what I'm challenging you with because I love you. And, and my job and responsibility is to protect our flock, right? 
So here's what I'm challenging you with today. Be alert, be on guard. Pray for discernment and ask the Spirit of the Lord. And I promise you, if you ask the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit will, will, will confirm in your heart when truth is spoken. So be on guard, be alert, pray for discernment. I encourage you to do that. That was Jude's mission and purpose. As we read and study the book of Jude over the next few weeks, you will will come to understand that's his mission and purpose. See, Jude is the only New Testament book devoted exclusively to confronting false teachers. Paul talks about it. The epistles talk about it. But Jude is the only book that is solely dedicated to confronting false teachers, false doctrine, and heretics. And he's calling for discernment on the part of the church. He's calling for us, the people of God, to have a deep, passionate pursuit for biblical truth. And church, again, make no mistake, we're living, I shared it earlier, we're living in perilous days, wars, rumors of wars. These are the signs of the times that are before us. But the church of Jesus Christ, we must be committed to good doctrine and sound theology. Church, what we say matters, what we teach matters, and what we listen to and fill our heart with matters. And I believe with all my heart in these dark days that the church must have something to say. I see too many churches, particularly American churches, that that, that have just gone radio silent in these days that we live in. Listen, the church must have a voice in this dark day. The church must stand for truth. We must proclaim the righteousness of God. The church must have strength and confidence in these days to preach without compromise to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I preached it a few weeks ago. How will they know unless we tell them? How will they know? How will they know unless the church has a voice? How will they know if the church goes dark? How will they know if the church goes silent? It's our job, our responsibility to tell them. May we be faithful. Amen? May we be faithful. May we be strong. May we have resolve. May we speak truth and love. And may we have something to say in these perilous times. And I just believe with all my heart that the church has something to say. The church has something to say about righteousness. And the church, the church has something to say about truth. And the church has something to say about the love of God. And I think the world's craving the church to talk about these things. I think the world is craving truth. I think they are so weary of lies and falsehood. I think they are dying for someone to speak truth to them in love. So let's be those people. Let's be those people that have something to say in these difficult and perilous days. That's the book of Jude. That's the message of this short 25-verse book. Be strong, be courageous, be faithful, be alert. Think about it this way. Jude is, is calling us to live on guard. He's calling us to be alert. Listen, it's a safeguard for us. And listen, we have safeguards in our life. We're we're not unfamiliar with those. Think about safeguards that maybe you've just seen today. I was driving to church this morning. Heidi and I came early. We took a detour by a coffee shop (laughs) and we got stuck by a train. Normally we come the other way and we, we don't get hit by the train that many times you have to deal with. What happens? The, the arms come down, the lights are flashing. What? It's a safeguard, right? Look out, be alert. There's something coming. There's a potential danger just around the corner. Think about safeguards that you see every day. Signs like danger keep out, caution ahead. I mean, we can go on and on and on. These are signs. They're indicators. There's, they're warnings to us to what? Be careful, to be alert, to be on guard. We should Treat it the same way spiritually in our heart and in our life. And listen, this is important to us at CLA. I want you to know this, and I shared it with the first service as well. I take great concern. We take great concern as a church that no one would ever come and harm us here. In, In light of all of the things that we see in the news every day, I want you to know that we have put known and unknown safeguards in place. Because my job is to protect you spiritually and our job is to also protect you and your families physically. And so, yeah. So we do things like Lower Allen Police. They're here every Sunday 
fully clothed. We want them to be seen. We want that to be a deterrent. Can we thank our first responders today for, for all that they do? Fire, police, EMTs, all of our first responders. They are here on purpose. It, it, is, it is a deterrent. We have a security team here that works diligently. And they are a warning to anyone who would potentially want to come and cause harm. And I want you to know we will do everything in our power to protect you and your family spiritually and physically. It's what we do with our kids, the check-in process, video cameras, police on site, right? So we do the same thing spiritually too. That's what Jude is all about. That's precisely what Jude is doing for us spiritually. He's calling believers, he's calling the church to be alert, to be on guard, to live with certain safeguards. And as you read it, you will see a great urgency in Jude's heart. I have a great urgency. I believe you do too. A great urgency in our heart in the season we're living in. And I pray that the next few weeks as we study this book, it will inspire you and cause you to open your spiritual eyes and to live being alert and live on point and be on guard. So would you stand with me? Let's turn to the book of Jude, almost all the way to the back. <laughs> or we'll make it easy for you, and it'll be on the screen, whatever works best for you. Possibly the most neglected book or letter in the entire Bible, maybe second only to Job. I have so many people that tell me they don't read the book of Job. Like, you need to read the book of Job. <laughs> it's it's a good book of the faithfulness of God. I don't know why people ignore it, but maybe only second to the book of Job. Jude may be the most neglected book or letter in the Bible. And I want us to read it in its entirety today, although I will only make it through two verses, one and two. But I want you to hear Jude in its context. And I want everything we just talked about to come to life to you. And I want you to hear this clarion call to be alert. So let's pick up in verse one. 25 verses. This letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. I'm writing to all who have been called by God the Father who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more mercy, peace, and love. Dear friends, I had been eagerly planning to write you about the salvation we all share, but now I find that I must write about something else. There's a turn and a shift in his heart. He senses it. I have to write something different, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all to his holy people. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to remind you, though you already know these things, what do I tell you? Many times my job is to remind you of what you already know. So Jude is saying in verse 5, I'm reminding you of things you already know, that Jesus Christ rescued the nation of Israel from Egypt, but later he destroyed those who did not remain faithful. And I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belong. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. And don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. Those cities were destroyed by fire and serve as a warning of the internal fire of God's judgment. In the same way, these people who claim authority from their dreams live immoral lives, defy authority, and scoff at supernatural beings. But even Michael, one of the mightiest of the angels, did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy, blasphemy but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. This took place when Michael was arguing with the devil about Moses' body. But these people scoff at things they do not understand. Like unthinking animals, they do whatever their instincts tell them and so they bring about their own destruction. What sorrow awaits them? For they follow in the footsteps of Cain, who killed his brother. Like Balaam, they receive people, uh, deceive people for money. And like Korah, they perish in their rebellion. When these people eat with you in your fellowship meals, commemor commemorating the Lord's love, they are like dangerous reefs that can shipwreck you. They're like blameless, shameless shepherds who care only for themselves. 
They're like clouds blowing over the land without giving any rain. They're like trees in autumn that are doubly dead, for they bear no fruit and have been pulled up by the roots. They're like wild waves of the sea, churning up the foam of their shameful deeds. They're like wandering stars doomed forever to darkest black, uh, blackest darkness. Enoch, who lived in the seventh generation after Adam prophesied about these people, he said, listen, the Lord is coming with countless thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on the people of the world. He would convict every person of all the ungodly things they've done and for all the insults that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These people are grumblers and complainers, living only to satisfy their desires. They brag loudly about themselves and they flatter others to get what they want. But you, my dear friends, must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ predicted. They told you that in the last times there would be scoffers. I argue that we are living in the last times. We are in the last days. I don't know the day or the hour, but I see the signs of the times. They told you that in the last times there will be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. These people are the ones who are creating divisions among you. They follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's spirit in them. But you, dear friends, must build, hear this, this is about us, this is talking to us, but you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and await the mercy of of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. And you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. And I think one of the greatest closings in all of Scripture is Jude 24 and 25. Now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his. Before all time and in the present and beyond all time. Can you say it with me? Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it is a, a safeguard, a a flashing light, a caution to us. And Lord Jesus, I pray that we would be people that live on guard, that live on point, that live alert. Open our eyes to the realities of what are around us, what's around us, and God, keep our, keep our hearts, our, our minds, our, our eyes fixed on you. Hide me behind your cross. I want to speak your words today. We love and praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. You may be seated. Thank you. So you can go home now and say, I read an entire book of the Bible in church. <laughs> All right, let's unpack some of this. We're going to stay in verse 1 and 2 today. Let's look at some of the details of Jude. Right out of the gate, he wants us to know who he is. Verse 1, this letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Now that word makes us a little uncomfortable in our, in our culture, in our world. Jude what Jude is communicating to us is, I'm a, I'm a servant of Christ. I, I've given Jesus everything in my life. I, I, I have surrendered my life to, to his power, to his authority, to his word. I'm, I'm a slave. I'm a servant of Jesus and a brother of James. So the biblical book of Jude is written by, you guessed it, Jude, right? And in verse 1, he, he wants us to know. He, he identifies who he is, and he does it in two ways. Again, a slave of Jesus, a brother of James, and it's important to him that his readers, that's us, this is all happening through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but that we would know who this man Jude is. Now, there are, there are several James in the New Testament, but it's clear that Jude is referring to James, the brother of Jesus, and if you know anything about James, he was the leader of the Jerusalem church during Paul's missionary journey. So this had... It's had pretty high significance when he says, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, brother, of, I'm the brother of James. That, that's a significant family connection. But as significant as the family connection may be, for Jude, identifying with Jesus is the most important thing in his life. 
For Jude, it's paramount that, that, that we know, yes, he's the brother of James, and that holds some, some, some clout uh, culturally, but, but what he really wants us to know is that he's radically sold out to Jesus. I'm a slave. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a servant of Jesus. His family relationship with James takes a backseat to the spiritual relationship that he has with Jesus. Let me put it this way. That's what marks Jude's life, being a follower of Jesus. And let me just pause for a moment. Isn't that what should be the mark of our life as well, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but, but that's what I want to be known for. And we're all known for a lot of things. We probably have a lot of titles. Many of you are business owners or you're a supervisor. You may be called boss or, or leader on your team, whatever it may be. We all have lots of titles, pastor. We have dad, we have mom, we have, we have friend, we have brother, we have sister. Listen, we all have, we all have lots of titles. We're known for lots of things. But being a follower of Jesus, being a servant of Jesus Christ, church, that's the highest calling that we can have. And I would argue that that's the greatest title that anyone can put on us. I'm a follower of Jesus. And let me tell you, the, you know what the world needs to see? They don't need to see more religion. They need to see more people really living out their faith in front of them. I mean, really being a servant of Jesus Christ. That's what the world needs. The world needs us to authentically live out our faith in front of them. Not on Sundays. Anybody in the world can be a Christian for an hour and a half in this room. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you leave here and when you interact with the neighbor and you interact with the, with the coworker and you interact with the person that, that, that you come across on the, on the streets or, or in the neighborhood or the job, whatever it may be. What, what, how are we living Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right? That's what the world needs to see. Our, our, our words... I, I, I need to be consistent. Our behavior needs to be consistent with the, with the label that we may wear or that we may put on us. They need to see Jesus in us. And so Jude tells us, I'm a slave of Jesus. I'm a, I'm a servant. I'm a servant of Christ and a brother of James. He wants his identity to be clear. And I think that's just consistent with who Jude is. And as we, as we unpack the book over the next few weeks, I think you'll see it's just how he's wired. He's direct. He's very no nonsense. He's straightforward. And I don't know about you, but those are the kind of people I like to be around, right? I don't want to have to guess. Come on, just tell me what you're thinking, right? Just, just, those people that you're like, what did they mean by that? Hmm. I think they were, I think they meant something else by that, right? I want to be around people like Jude that just tell you what they feel. Their convictions come out of their mouth. You, 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 you know where they stand. And Jude is no nonsense. He's, he's straightforward. He has a straightforward approach to the life that we are all called to live for Jesus. A calling that we are all commanded and called to, to live this life for Jesus in a world that's filled with sin and rebellion. And I believe today, I believe believers, I believe the church needs a no-nonsense, straightforward, direct approach to living the life we're called to live. I think we've watered things down too much because we want people to feel good and we don't want anybody to leave because we got to keep the lights on and we got to pay the bills, right? I think people need truth and I think they need straightforward truth. I think they need no nonsense truth and we just need to talk about what it means to live for Jesus. And that's Jude. He's just telling us with this no nonsense, straightforward, direct approach, live the life you've been called to live. And to him, it's just being a biblical Christian. It's living out our faith. Again, that's what we're called to do. We're called to be like Jesus. And I can't help but believe as I read the word that we're just called to reflect Jesus in everything we do and everything we say. I mean, isn't that what a Christian is supposed to be? And in Jude's day, which I suggest is no different than our current day, as I mentioned, believers were facing huge issues with false teachers. These false teachers or, or heretics, they were from within the church. They were not an opposing force outside of the church. They were within the church. They were part of the church. They were immoral, 
manipulative teachers who were causing divisions among God's people. And so if you believe that our day is no different than Jude's day, then that's even more reason for us, church, to do what? To live alert, to be on guard, to pray for discernment. Why? Because people are seeking to cause division among God's people. And when I say that, I mean capital C Church, the people of God, the kingdom of God. We briefly discussed them already, but people that are causing confusion and sowing discord and division among God's people in his church. The Bible refers to them as wolves in sheep's clothing. And they're in the church today just like they were in Jude's day. And so all of this comes together, bad teaching, bad doctrine, heresy, all of it caused Jude, remember this no-nonsense, straightforward guy, and I think he's a good pastor, I think he's a faithful and loving pastor, all of this caused him to address these issues head on and to address these false teachers and these heretics head on. And Jude's approach was really simple. I love it. No nonsense, direct. His approach was really simple. Jude's response to the heresy of his day was to just live for God. And let me tell you, it's not changed. That's the answer to everything in your life spiritually. Just live for God. When times are tough, live for God. In times of blessing and favor, live for God. When financial things are tough, live for God. When family situations are stressful, live for God. It's the answer every day, every moment of our life. Wake up, put your feet on the ground and say, I'm gonna live for Jesus today. I'm gonna give him everything I have today. Not part of my heart, all of my heart. Not lukewarm, totally bought in. It's his response, live for God, live for Jesus. It hasn't changed. Godly living is still the solution for our day. Church, hear me, it still works. When you come to Jesus, listen, it demands a change of direction in your life. We don't talk about this enough. When I accepted Jesus, I had to make a significant course correction in my life. When you come to know Jesus, hear me today, whether you've been serving him for two days or for 20 years, when you come to know Jesus, it demands that you live differently. There's some things you have to lay down. There's some things you have to pick up. There's some things you have to remove from your life. There's some things you have to pray into your life. It demands that we make a course correction from the way we were before to the way that God wants us to be. Commitment, sacrifice, serving Jesus. Listen, there has to be a noticeable change in your life when you're following Jesus. Unfortunately, today, people want Jesus and the world. They want a little Jesus and a little of the world. What a good recipe, right? I can go to church on Sunday. I can do all the church stuff. And then I can go to the bar or the clubs or the whoever's and the whatever's and I can live however I want. I go back on Sunday, I can lift my hands and I can start it all over again. They want a little Jesus and a little bit of the world. And I can't find anywhere in scripture where that works. Because Jesus calls us to be set apart. He calls us to live different. They want a little bit of Jesus, but they still want their sin. They want a little bit of Jesus, but they still want control of their life. They want the benefits of Jesus without the required sacrifice to live for him. There has to be a marked difference when we surrender our life to Jesus. They want Jesus and their earthly pleasures. Man, this is old school preaching today, right? Listen, how you live your life is the clear indicator of your heart. It's the fruit that comes out of your life. It's the indicator of the transformation that Jesus has made in your life or the lack of transformation that you're allowing him to make. Because listen, Jesus wants to radically change your life. He wants to change you from the inside out. When I came to know Jesus, there's, again, there's stuff I had to lay down in my life. There's friendships I had to walk away from. There's some people I had to walk away from. There's some influences that I had to walk away from. 
There has to be a marked difference in your life when you call yourself a follower of Jesus. How you live your life is the clear indicator of your heart. I said it earlier. It matters, church. How you live matters. What you do matters. What you say matters. What you listen to and watch and put in your heart matters. And Jude, a slave of Jesus and the brother of James, he's encouraging us, the church, to do some really basic biblical Christian living things. And he lays them out in 25 verses, things like defending the faith. He tells us to be alert for false teachers and those who cause division. He challenges us to build each other up in the faith. He tells us to pray in the power of the Holy Spirit to keep ourselves safe in God's love, to show mercy to those whose faith is weak and wavering. I'm gonna get to this in the chapter, but let me tell you many times, church, we're not very gentle with those that are struggling in their faith. We can be really harsh to those that maybe are not in the same place in their journey as we are. We can be harsh, we can be condemning, we can be, We can be judgmental. And the Bible tells us that we should show mercy to those whose faith is weak and wavering. Because guess what? When we show mercy to them in love and we speak truth to them in love, guess what? They come back into relationship with Christ. They deepen their walk. They lay some of those things down that maybe are so hard for them. And let me pause for a moment. Don't forget your journey. It may have been 20, 30 years Don't forget how hard it was in your journey to lay some things down. How quickly we forget our journey. How quickly we forget how hard it was to let go of some of those things. And how quick we are to judge someone else when we see it in their life. Show mercy to those whose faith is weak and wavering. And then the last one, he says, be assured of our salvation. That's the book of Jude. Those are the things we're called to do as followers of Jesus. And make no mistake, I said it earlier, this book is written to the church. This is for us. This is for the church in Jude's day, and it is for the church of Jesus Christ in 2023. This letter is to and for the people of God. Look in verse one. I'm writing to all who have been called by God the Father. That's us. That's Christ followers. That's the church of Jesus Christ. I am writing to all who have been called by God the Father. So verse one is clear. This letter is to the church. Then something happens in verse two that's so powerful. Jude pauses for a moment and he does something that is just, I think it's so beautiful, powerful and inspiring. Guess what? He prays for us. And I believe he prays one of the most beautiful prayers in scripture. Go to verse two. Look at his prayer. May God give you more and more mercy, peace and love. How many of you say, amen, I receive that, right? I want that. I need that. What he's saying is, here is my prayer for you. In the middle of a rebellious time, in the middle of a challenging day, in the middle of the last days that we're in, here's my prayer for you. I pray that God would give you more and more mercy, peace, and love. I want to pause for a moment, and I want to talk about something that I'm not sure we think of often enough. I want us to talk about mercy. See, mercy is where God does not give us what we deserve. And and I want you to make it personal today. Mercy is where God does not give Shane Wilson what he deserves. Put your name in, into into that thought. Mercy is where God does not give me, give us what we deserve. When was the last time you thought about God's mercy in your life? Maybe outside of a sermon or a Bible study. I don't know. Mercy probably is not a word that we, that we contemplate or ponder often. But I want you to consider something this morning for just a moment. I want you to consider what if instead of God not giving us what we deserve, mercy, what if God gave us what we deserved? <laughs> Some of you, just a shock of terror went through your body, right? What if God, what if God gave me what, what I deserve? How would that change my life? What if God wouldn't have sent his son, Jesus? 
What if God would have just left us to figure this thing out on our own? What if we didn't have the Holy Spirit's power or the convicting work of the Spirit in our life? I shared this with first service, and I've shared this with you before. Listen, when God convicts you of doing something wrong, thank Jesus for it, right? When you think a bad thought and you start feeling crummy, thank Jesus for that. When you have some, some bad habits or some, some behaviors in your life that you're trying to break and, 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 and you, you, you make a, a wrong step or a misstep and you, you, you indulge in that thing and then you begin to feel the heaviness and the, and the weight of, of conviction, thank God when you feel that way because that means Jesus loves us enough that the Holy Spirit's still working on us to make us who he wants us to be. When I feel bad for something I thought or something that, that raced through my mind, I try to immediately stop before I do anything and say, thank you, Jesus, that you love me enough to convict me, that you're still working on me on the inside to make me who you want me to be. What would happen if we didn't have the Spirit's convicting work in our life? What if We didn't have Jesus to bear the punishment that we deserve. When I think of those things, a a few words quickly come to my mind. The word lost, the word desperate, the word hopeless. Church, we would be hopelessly lost without mercy. Hopelessly lost without mercy. But, but you know as well as I do, I'm so thankful that, that God is a God of mercy. Can you say amen today? Can you just thank the Lord for mercy that he's granted you and mercy that you've received in your life? We serve a loving and forgiving and merciful God. And Jude is praying for that. He's praying and he's asking God to give us more and more mercy. Peace and love. I'm so thankful for mercy today. I'm thankful that God did not give me what I deserved because I deserve punishment. I deserve consequences. I deserve distance from God. We deserve death, right? But instead, come on, this is your story too. But instead, but instead, God gave us life. Instead, he gave us hope. Instead, he gave us nearness and fellowship. Instead, come on, he gave us the assurance of eternity. You can have eternity secure in your heart today if if you've surrendered your life to Jesus. He gave us mercy. Mercy. Mercy came and rescued me. Mercy came and and rescued you more and more of God's mercy, more and more of God's peace, more and more of God's love. I'm so thankful for God's mercy today. I wouldn't be here without it. Juan, if you wanna, if you wanna come back. I know what I deserve. You know what you deserve. I still have enough memory of my past to to know where I should be today. And I shouldn't be standing in front of you in a church. But mercy. But mercy. I know your stories, many of them. Many of you shouldn't be here today, right? Because the enemy had a different plan for your life. The enemy had a different course and a different trajectory for your life. But you're here today because of mercy. Because of grace because of peace, because of the love of God. And listen, I don't know where you are in your journey, but you should thank God for mercy today. You should thank God for mercy. That God loved you so much that in spite of you, and in spite of our mistakes, and in spite of our our desires and the the way we were living in spite of all of that. He sent his son. And Jesus willingly came. Mercy. Mercy. Mercy left heaven and put on flesh. Mercy was born in a barn. 
Mercy lived a sinless life. Mercy was forced to carry his own cross. He had nails driven in his hands and feet. Mercy. Mercy. Mercy rescued me. (laughs) I know how I lived. I I know what I wanted in my life. I know the, the former trajectory of my life. And mercy came and saved me. Mercy came and rescued me. Jude prays more and more of God's mercy, peace, and love. See, church, if we don't understand mercy for ourselves, if we can't wrap our head and our heart around God's mercy, listen, if you don't have a personal understanding of God's mercy and how utterly hopeless and lost you are without it, if you don't understand that, then how will we ever show mercy to anyone else? How can we give mercy away if we don't fully understand it in our own heart? That's what Jude prays. I want you to have more and more mercy, more and more peace, more and more love. If we don't understand mercy in our own heart, then how can we be merciful to those who don't know Jesus? Mercy is what compels us to go to India and to go to the Navajo Nation in Arizona and to go to Philadelphia and to go to Harrisburg and to go to El Salvador and to go to Peru and to go to Cholo, West Virginia. Not so somebody can say, look what Christian Life Assembly does. I don't care if anyone knows our name or if anyone knows the name of, of, of Christian Life Assembly or Shane Wilson. I want them to know mercy in their life. I want to help introduce them to mercy so that they can make an exchange with the brokenness of their life and the sin and the rebellion of their life and they can have an exchange with mercy and with grace and with peace and love. Mercy, more and more of God's mercy, peace and love. If we don't understand mercy, how can we ever be merciful to those who have never had an opportunity to experience Jesus. If we do not understand God's mercy for ourselves, how will we be merciful? How will we show mercy to others who are in need? I would suggest that we won't. I would suggest that we can't. We won't be merciful to those who are drifting. We won't be merciful to those who are lost without Christ. We won't be merciful to those, as I said earlier, who may be taking a little longer in their journey than we have. Mercy. Let me just challenge you today. I'll pick, I'll pick up here next week, but let me challenge you today. We have an opportunity when we leave here to give mercy away. If you've received it, then you understand it. And you know it. And you know how life-changing it is. What would happen today if you gave it away? Maybe there's somebody in your life that's struggling. Maybe there's somebody that they're they're, they're on this journey with God, but they're just not at the place that you would want them to be. Listen, they're probably not at the place they want to be. What would happen if you showed mercy today? Some of you are going to a restaurant afterwards. You're going to someone's house. What, What would happen if we gave mercy away? What would happen if we stopped somewhere on the way and we gave, we gave mercy away? Jude's prayer is that we would have more and more mercy, peace, and love. What if we gave mercy and peace and love away today in the name of Jesus? What would happen today if we made Jude's prayer our prayer? And we prayed today, God, give me more and more mercy, more and more peace, and more and more love so that I can go in this dark and difficult world and I can show them what the love of Jesus looks like. That's Jude's prayer. It's his calling to us. Let's make that prayer our prayer today. I'm gonna invite you to stand with me. I wanna pray with you. I wanna pray that we can leave here in just a few moments. We can be the people of God that we're called to be. And we give away what's been freely given to us. I want to give you an opportunity, someone an opportunity to know Jesus. I just feel compelled to do that. And I'm going to invite you, church, to pray with me. As I've said before, hell gets really angry in moments like this. I shared with you in the beginning of the message, today could be the most important day of your life. Don't miss it. 
can't pray the prayer for you. I can only give you some words. You have to make it yours. You have to open your heart to mercy. And you have to allow mercy to come and rescue you today. Would you bow your heads with me across the church? And I'm going to ask Christians to just pray. Really, I mean, bombard heaven right now. And I'm speaking to somebody here today that you've, maybe you've never accepted Jesus. Maybe you've accepted Christ and, man, you're just so far away from where you want to be with him. And you want to come back to center. You, you, want, you want mercy to win today and mercy to rescue you today. Listen, if you open your heart, I promise Jesus will exchange whatever mistakes and missteps you've made. He'll exchange it with mercy and grace and love. Let him do that today in your life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm going to ask you, if that's you today, would you just lift your hand? I'm going to pray for you. This isn't about church or religion. I just want to know who I'm praying for today. Yeah, pray for me, Pastor. Pray. Yeah, I see you up top. Oh, I see you on the bottom here at the balcony floor. Jesus. Yeah, I see you up top. <laughs> it's the greatest day of your life. I see you up top. I see you on the floor. Greatest day of your life. Greatest day of your life. I see you in the back. Greatest day of your life. <laughs> Mercy wins. Mercy rescues today. Oh, we love you, Jesus. I'm going to invite everybody to pray this prayer with me. And if you're here and you lifted your hand or you're watching from somewhere and you you say, I identify with that person. That's, that's where I'm at. I'm, I'm hopeless. I'm lost. I need Jesus. Just pray this prayer with us. It's a simple prayer. Make it your own. Would you pray these words with me? Dear Jesus, I surrender my life to you today. With all of my mistakes and all of my sin, forgive me from all of my sin. Forgive me from all of my mistakes and missteps. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for saving me. I surrender everything in my life to you. I'm all in today, Jesus. I love you. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's thank the Lord today. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. I'm going to invite our prayer team, our pastors to come. If you lifted your hand today and gave your life to Jesus, we'd love to pray with you. There's some information on the screen that would put some information in your hands about the prayer that you just prayed and the decision that you just made. Hey, what, ha what would happen today if we leave here and we give mercy and grace and love away? We could change the world, amen? Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for mercy. We thank you for peace. We thank you for love. God, may we go today and give away what's already been freely given to us. We love you. We praise you. We thank you that mercy rescued us. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day in the Lord.